All right. Does this help? Yeah. This help? Okay. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, as I said, uh, I was looking for a, a group of, uh, of veterans to kind of associate with, and uh, I, I think this, this group is uh, about as good as it gets, and I also attended the uh, Vietnam Veterans Organization down in uh, Lakewood, I think it is, with uh, John over here, and there's, there's about a hundred of those guys. And it is just, uh, it's good to uh, associate with uh, you who understand a little bit about what it was like to be in the military and your families, because your families uh, experienced a lot of the same stuff that you did uh, as a veteran, as you well know. In fact, they kept the family together. <laughs> while we went off to wherever we went. So uh, <clears throat> my story starts in a little town in western Colorado, Montrose, Colorado. Uh, it's about 300 miles west of here, and that's where I grew up, went to high school. And, uh, and then I went to college in uh, Gunnison, Western State college and this is in the uh, mid 60s so you remember what was happening in the mid 60s a lot of you guys were uh, heavily involved with uh, war Viet Vietnam <clears throat> so they were recruiting very heavily in uh, Western State for for pilots uh, and the reason was was because uh, a lot of a lot of uh, our uh, Air Force and Navy and Marine pilots were being shot down in Vietnam. It was a serious time. So they were recruiting heavily, and for some reason, they liked to recruit in the West. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, it had to do with the farm boy attitude, uh, the hard working ethic that uh, many of us had and still do uh, from, the, from the West. And so uh, I, I picked up in about my junior year and I went on a <clears throat> an expedition with the Navy. They sent me out to Naval Air Station Oakland and recruited me and uh, I was under contract. The minute I graduated from college, boom, I went to uh, Pensacola. Pensacola is where the Navy trains all of their pilots. Uh, the Air Force, you go to like Enid, Oklahoma. So. Pensacola was great for us because uh, I had been married just before we left. My wife is right here. Melody is her name. And she went with me. And <clears throat> I think it was the first time that, uh, that we had been past, like, Denver East. <laughs> we, we went to uh, Pensacola, which was on the uh, ocean. Had a, had a, a, a great time. Uh, she did. I was in basic training. Uh, the Navy uses Marine gunnery sergeants uh, in their basic training, and those guys were tough. And I thought I was tough when I went in, but I wasn't. <laughs> um, so uh, after, after uh, basic training, they always send you to uh, basic flight training, which uh, occurred in Pensacola, and it started with this trainer right here, T-34 Mentor. They're still using the updated version of this, which is a turboprop airplane. This was a piston airplane. And they started you uh, training in this airplane. And it, it was good training. It was better than civilian training. Uh, I had uh, my pilot's license when I went in because when I was about 17, my dad came to me and he said, uh, I need you to learn how to fly because he had a business in Montrose and he did a lot of business in Denver and he was tired of driving. So he paid for my uh, flight training in Montrose and I got a private license and then later on a commercial and instrument. But when we got to the Navy, that's when you really learn how to fly because it's, uh, it's not uh, like leisure flying. It is very disciplined, highly disciplined from the very beginning. Uh, the emphasis was attention to details because those details later on in your career would save your neck. And, and they did, honestly. So we started out in the T-34. The next thing we did was uh, we got orders to Meridian, Mississippi. Now, who would ever think that there was a naval air station in Meridian, Mississippi? Well, the field was named Stennis Field. Senator John Stennis owned a bunch of land in Mississippi, out in the middle of a, a swamp, 
and he donated it to the Navy if they would put an air base there, and they did. So I went through uh, nine months of training in Meridian, Mississippi. It culminated in uh, car carrier qualifications in the T-2. Uh, that's a very safe jet. It's straight wing. It's uh, very forgiving. Uh, very, very well built, and uh, my first trap on the uh, Lexington was uh, in, that, in that airplane right there. Uh, and I'll tell you more about that as we go, but that was where you started the, the Navy part of your flight training, was in Meridian, Mississippi. Next thing, we were sent to uh, Kingsville, Texas, down by Corpus Christi, VT-23. Uh, it was a training squadron, uh, and we flew the TA-4. The A-4 Skyhawk is a wonderful machine. Um, you didn't get into it, you strapped it on. That's how close it was. In fact, you actually had to, ha had to put your arms in like this for the canopy to come down. It was a, it was a wonderful machine, and it culminated in uh, six more traps aboard the Lexington, um, and that was, that was what happened. And then. Uh, I got my wings in 72, went back to Pensacola as a flight instructor uh, because they needed instructors and all the fleet seats were full at the time. So I went back as, as an instructor pilot. And this airplane right here is a holdover from the Korean War. In fact, it was one of the uh, last squadrons to fly the uh, F-9 Cougar made by Grumman. And I got a few hours as an instructor in that airplane. It was the only airplane that I ever flew that would uh, was supersonic. This one would be supersonic because it was clean. It didn't have drop tanks, and pylons, and things like that. So the way you did this was you struggled to 30,000 feet. And I mean struggled because this engine was really an old engine, centrifugal flow engine. And then you put it upside down, straight down, and went to full power and it would go through Mach 1 at, at, in just a few seconds. And then you better start reefing it back up because it was a long, it was, it was very hard to, to get that thing back up to the level. But that was uh, the Cougar jet. The, the, this was one of the <laughs> first Navy, or, uh, Navy jets to uh, work the, uh, the aircraft carriers. Uh, its predecessor was the F-9 uh, Panther, which was a straight-wing version of this, and they worked those off of the, uh, the carriers. So I spent two years in Pensacola. It was a good time for our family. Uh, and, and then in 1974, I got orders to a fleet squadron, <clears throat> VA-94, based in Lemoore, California. Uh, flew the A-7 Corsair II, okay? The big difference is, of course, sir, one was a World War II airplane, classic airplane. It was the one that had the gold wing. Uh, in fact, there's one on the top of, uh, there, there it is right there on his hat. Yes. <laughs> I put a picture of our family on there because uh, when you go to fleet orders, your family really takes a lot of responsibility. My wife, uh, that is my wife. Right there. <laughs> uh, my son, uh, Jared, on the left there, he is. Uh, he now works for the DEA. Uh, lives in uh, Ankara, Turkey, um, and my daughter, JC, lives right here in Erie with us. But uh, the reason I put that picture up there is because every Navy family uh, has to deal with separations at some point. The definition of Navy is boats, and you go, you go aboard a, a boat and your family stays put. And they, they have a lot of responsibility. And I'm not going to say just the Navy either. It's the Air Force too, you, and, and Army, Marines, all of us had separation. It just comes with the, the military life. You, you understand that very well. Uh, so anyway, I, I, uh, in 1974, uh, four, we headed for California. Uh, we went through what is called a RAG, R-A-G, it's a replacement air group, I, uh, to, to transition into the A-7. And then uh, in 1975, uh, headed for uh, Yankee Station off Vietnam. Uh, I got there in May of 75, and this was what was happening, the evacuation of Saigon. Uh, it was a huge effort. Uh, 
And our job over the top was basically to just keep the communist forces from the north from overtaking the south while we evacuated. And we were getting people out any way we possibly could out of Vietnam. Uh, this was the helicopter operation, and these helicopters would take these people, the South Vietnamese, all of them they wanted, and all that we could possibly get in the helicopters would come out to the carriers. We would put them, uh, we would house them actually on, in the hangar bay. And then the, the helicopters would run until the helicopter couldn't fly anymore. It broke down. We had to quit. So there was a defining point when we could not evacuate any more people. And you can see that this is one way they did it. This story right here, I was aboard the, I was on the Coral Sea right next door to the Midway. We were both on Yankee Station. And one day we saw this little uh, O-1 bird dog, which was a forward air controlling aircraft. It was a prop airplane. Uh, we used them and the South Vietnamese used them to call in airstrikes. And this is a two-seated airplane, okay? Uh, so this little airplane showed up over the Midway and he was circling uh, and he just kept circling. Well, the captain of the Midway said, clear the flight deck, we'll take this guy aboard. And he, he put a, uh, gave the, the carrier as much power as he could, sped the boat up to about top speed, which was about 28 knots. <laughs> That's about 35 miles an hour. And this guy's landing speed is about 50, so he was just barely closing. We, we all watched this take place. Uh, he was barely closing on the ship, and he finally just put it right over the flight deck, cut the power, and landed. Seven people got out of this two-place airplane. A South Vietnamese uh, officer, his wife, and five kids. This is a two-seated airplane. It made the papers. Uh, it was an amazing thing. Uh, but, but I think the amazing thing was that the captain of the Midway would risk uh, many things by allowing this guy to come aboard. That was how desperate the, this, uh, the, this Saigon operation was. So I thought that was an interesting story. Um, so I was there until uh, that uh, concluded. And uh, we came back to the States in the Coral Sea. And uh, 1977, uh, left again in January. And this was during a Cold War cruise. Well, not much gets said about the Cold War. Uh, so I'm going to just kind of review the main events of the Cold War. Uh, you'll see that uh, these are huge nuclear weapons. The sign says on no account to be used because the enemy might retaliate. Well, that's evidence of the arms, <coughs> arms race that took place during the Cold War. And if that wasn't uh, threatening, uh, 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 the biggest threat that we could think of was multiple nuclear warheads. But here we are down here, the, the Western forces and the uh, Eastern Bloc forces, and we're throwing arrows at each other. Well, those arrows represented the uh, tension that was between us and the Russians, uh, mostly the Soviet Union, not the Russians, it was the Soviet Union uh, at that time. And, and so this is, this is what took place. So here, here's basically the, the scenario of uh, the Cold War. The West was trying to hold the line on communism because it was spreading and had spread since the end of World War II. I mean, they were on a roll. They rolled into East Germany, took a lot of land, as you know, uh, and then started taking more countries. The Eastern uh, European bloc was completely under the auspices of the USSR. That's why they called it the Soviet uh, uh, Republic, it's because they had so many, so many bloc countries with them. So here, here are some of the main events that took place in the Cold War, just to, just to remind you that there was uh, a really tense situation. 1948, the Berlin blockade took place. Uh, we had a huge air drop into Berlin right after that took place because that was the only way we could get in, and so we did. 
the arms race started in 1949. That's when the nuclear weapons increased by great numbers. 1950, the Korean War. Well, you say that wasn't part of the Cold War. Well, in fact, it was called a proxy war, which means that it's still the communists versus the West, but we just met in another country, in this case, Korea. That happened in 1950. 1957, we started the space race. That was basically the same, same thing, uh, only it was done to gain territory out of, out of, uh, out of our atmosphere. 62, you all remember the Cuban mil Missile Crisis, part of the Cold War. 1965, we started uh, entering Vietnam. Uh, that was part of it uh, as well. We were there to stop the communist forces from taking over uh, Vietnam. Uh, 1989, that, that began uh, between 65 and 89. Uh, the Soviet Union started to fall apart, mostly economically. They realized that they could not sustain the huge armies and the huge amount of land that they now had procured. And so in 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down, and in 1991, the uh, USSR dissolves. Well, how big of a deal was that? <clears throat> well, communist was, in fact, halted. Communism, uh, the USSR dissolved. Russia is not the USSR, it's just a part of it. And many countries were liberated. <clears throat> what I mean by that is, uh, two years ago, uh, Melody and I were in Hungary uh, for Christmas, and uh, we were in a taxi, and the taxi driver said, I, I just want to thank you guys, because you stood firm. The US stood firm, didn't back down to communism, and today, we are free, meaning him in Hungary. They are free. And this all happened about 1991. All of the countries over there, and I'll tell you, they are thankful to the U.S. and to the Western allies, the allies as well. Okay, so I'd like to switch gears here just a, a little bit. Uh, and I have a, a tremendous appreciation for the Navy. <clears throat> Uh, not just because I was part of it, but because I see the tremendous job that they are tasked with at this time. So uh, what makes our planet, uh, a lot of people call it, is it is the blue planet. This picture was taken from outer space. Um, and it is, in fact, many people call it the blue planet. Does anybody know why? Because of the water, the oceans, that's right. <coughs> So uh, I would just like to kind of reiterate the, the importance of our oceans. Maybe you don't know this, but these are the major sea lanes of the world right, right now. And those red lines represent the travel of cargo ships. And uh, you can see that there are some uh, huge areas. Uh, in fact, at any one given time, we have 53,000 cargo ships either in port or on the high seas, 53,000. Now, in comparison, how many airplanes are in the sky right now? Maximum of about 20,000 around the entire world. So here, this is just gives you a comparison of ships to airplanes, 53,000 airplanes, 20,000 in the air. You can see that there are some very tight points where uh, these shipping lanes come together. Uh, the Straits of Hermos right here uh, by Arabia. Uh, this, this is a choke point and about 60% uh, of the world's oil comes through this narrow spot right here. This is the Straits of Malaga, which is down by Singapore. Uh, a huge area between Asia back to Africa and Europe. Uh, one of the busiest places on earth. Anybody know what that is right there? Straits of Dover. Yeah. Right south, it's the yeah, English Channel. Straits of Dover. Uh, tremendous area. So you can see how the shipping lanes of the world. Now, with the fact that uh, 53,000 ships are on the high seas at any one time, uh, and you, you know the, the state of our uh, country, there are a lot of, uh, not of, of our world, there are a lot of pirates 
all over this area right here. There are pirates uh, in this area, uh, pirates everywhere, and the Navy right now has a little over 400 ships maintaining these seaways right here, a little over 400. Okay, so you might not know this, but 70% of the world, of the earth is water. 80% of all humans on this earth live within 100 miles of an ocean. 90% of all commerce takes place on the ocean. Uh, those are pretty high figures. Uh, I didn't realize that, but I did some deep study into this, and 90% of our commerce. Well, you say, you know, UPS and, and uh, Fed Express, they're in the air, but not compared to the ocean. 90% of commerce. So the navies of the world, not just ours, but the navies of the world, protect this huge space and keep it open for business. This is why we defend the free movement and trade on our oceans. Okay, so the U.S. Navy uh, protects and defends America on, under, and over the world's oceans. Navy ships, submarines, aircraft, and most importantly, tens of thousands of America's finest young men and women. Thank you. Uh, and many from Colorado are deployed around the world uh, doing just that, the protection. So you can just see this is, this is a huge ship. And I'll show you how huge it is, but this is the most important factor right here, these folks. So we have a surface fleet, uh, talking specifically about the Navy. We have our surface fleet. We have our submarines. <clears throat> we have our naval aircraft. I'll speak a little bit more about that in <laughs> just a minute. And uh, let's see, I'm going to buy one. Okay. Uh, you know it's risky and you know that it's expensive to protect the vast seas of our planet. So why do we do it? Why do we protect our oceans? Okay. First of all, we defend America 24-7-365. No weekends, holidays. You look at this gentleman, he's the air boss on the, uh, this is the Lincoln. He is the air boss and he is tired. The, those ship guys, when you're at sea, uh, usually we work 12 on, 12 off. And those 12 on, you were, you were intense. You, you were focused all the time. The 12 off, you tried to recover. <laughs> Two, when our national security is threatened by the existence of weapons facilities or terrorist camps on the other side uh, of the world, our Navy is close, their presence matters. Third, when we need to act on one of these threats, for instance, the Osama bin Laden uh, incident, the Navy is there. Thank you, SEALs. They went in and took care of that. One of, their, one of their mottos, they have many, is people sleep peacefully in their beds at night only because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. Uh, the Navy also ensures free, uh, free flow of trade around the globe, preserving America's economic prosperity. Big factor, big factor. And fifth, Navy reacts to many humanitarian crises around the world, thus increasing our credibility as a friendly nation. Uh, you will remember the tsunami uh, in Thailand in 1991, I think it was. Uh, the Philippines had a tremendous uh, hurricane in about 2012. Our carriers, our ships were all there. What a, what a great mission they have. We also <clears throat> are part of the uh, interdiction of narco trafficking. Uh, that a lot of people don't know uh, how much that really is, but it's a big factor in today's U.S. Navy. So, life, liberty, and the pursuit of all who threaten it is kind of the another one of the Navy's mottos. Uh, this is just a little uh, plug for the Navy. <laughs> uh, our Navy is invaluable to the U.S. and to the world. All right, so that was just a plug for the oceans. Now I'd like to have some fun because uh, I was pretty uh, amazed by what took place on an aircraft carrier. I spent about three, three years off and on on an aircraft carrier, and I became uh, fascinated by the orchestration of flight operations around a ship right here. So let me tell you a few things about it. This is the USS Coral Sea. This is the one I was on, CV, CVA-43. 
carriers uh, were first uh, put together in 1922, the USS Langley, and it was a converted coal ship. Uh, they put a roof on it, straight roof, just put a roof up on top and started flying airplanes off of it. It was pretty primitive, uh, but they saw the advantage because the biggest advantage was getting somebody up above to see where your enemy was. Because when you're on the deck of a ship, you can see about five miles, and that's it. The horizon blocks anything past that five miles. You get an airplane at even 5,000 feet, they can see 50 miles out there, and they can say, hey, Captain, we've got a, a fleet of ships, and they don't look friendly coming towards us. So in the 1920s, the U.S. Navy took on the aspect that the, the aircraft carrier was going to be a major part of their fleet. Uh, this thing is, this is the, the bow, I'm sorry, this is the bow, this is the stern. We call this the fan tail back here. And from there to there is about a quarter mile. So if you walk or run, a quarter mile takes you, what, a couple of minutes? Yeah, if you're fast. If you're walking, it takes about uh, three or four minutes to walk from there to there. It's almost a quarter mile long. It weighs uh, 97,000 tons, uh, almost 100,000 tons, uh, and that's empty. You put the, the uh, air wing on it, which included about 100 airplanes. You could put about 40 on the flight deck and about 60 on the hangar deck, which was the one right below the flight deck, okay? Um, let's see, this, this is called the angle deck right here, and it, it saved many a life because the older ships were straight deck, just from the back to the front, and as you would land, they would just stack the airplanes up up here until the stack got to about right here, and the last guy to land, he had to land so that the pressure was on him. If he didn't land, he'd, he'd, many of them crashed into this, what we call the pack, the pack of, of, of aircraft. So, so, so what they did was they put a 10 degree uh, angle deck so that if you, if you don't catch a wire, there's four of them, one, two, three, four. If you don't catch a wire, then you just bolt, uh, bolt her off the front and you go back around and you land again. It kept everybody safe up front. <laughs> which is a big deal. The catapults, there's three of them on the Coral Sea. This one right here, these are called the bow cats. There's two, one, two, and then the third is the waist cat, which is this one right here. So you could shoot three airplanes, you could shoot two airplanes at the same time, one here and one here, and then shortly thereafter you can shoot the, the, the third one. So um, 5,000 men, uh, when, it, when the air wing was on board, we had 5,000 men on this ship right here. Uh, you had every convenience that the town of Erie has, the town of Broomfield. You have uh, everything you needed to eat, to sleep, to go to the doctor, the <laughs> dentist. Uh, they had, we had a huge bakery. Uh, we had a ship store. Everything was included in this ship. The shortcoming of the diesel-powered ships, which this one was, was you had to underway replenish when you were at sea about every other day. In other words, you had supply ships about every other day pulling up next to you and giving you fuel, giving you stores, giving you whatever you needed. The new ships, the nuclear ships, uh, they can stay at sea for uh, as long as 20 years without refueling. 20 years on a nuclear uh, piece, piece of fuel. And it's, they call it a cake, I believe is what they call it. Uh, in fact, uh, I was overseas when the USS Enterprise came out, which is the first nuclear ship, and every one of us wanted to go and get on that ship just to see it. And they told us that they had an eight pound keg of enriched uranium and they could stay at sea fuel wise, not personnel wise for 20 years on the eight, uh, eight pound keg. Amazing, uh, just, it's just incredible. The difference between Navy diesel and these things stank, <laughs> smelled really bad. Uh, the fuel, when they burned it, uh, the diesel, uh, the fumes back here after the ship were, were pretty bad. You didn't go back there very much. 
So uh, the 5,000 men, uh, they all sleep underneath the flight deck, of course. Uh, they went down as much as uh, 12 stories below this deck right here, the flight deck. Uh, it went down 12 stories. It came up uh, about six stories. This is called the island. It's where the, uh, the, the skipper sits on the bridge. The bridge is right in here. Air operations were run from a little booth on the on the this side, the flight deck side, and it was run by the Airbus. I showed you a picture a while ago of the of the Airbus. So that's uh, that's a carrier, uh, amazing machine, amazing machine. So we would actually uh, launch. We would have flight operations for 12 hours at a time. And during that 12 hours, you would launch about uh, six or seven uh, flights, depending on how they went. A flight would be about 15 airplanes would go off the front of the ship. As soon as they took off, 15 airplanes would come back and land. They would fuel those airplanes, and they'd be ready to shoot off in about an hour and a half. So a cycle was called, uh, we had about seven cycles during the day where you, you shot 15 airplanes off, landed 15 airplanes, and you did this for 12 hours. An amazing process. So I'd like to take you on a flight with me uh, from the Coral Sea, and uh, this is where we're going to start, is in the ready room. The ready room is where everything important takes place uh, other than the flying. Okay, this is where you breathe. This is where the air uh, AI officers, the air intelligence guys, come down and they tell you what your mission is and what your enemy looks like out there, what to watch for in Vietnam. It was the SAMs, the AAA. Uh, it, there was all kinds of different things that he knew where they were based on intelligence, Navy intelligence. And he would come in and brief us. The leader of the flight would stand up there and he would say, okay, this is what we're going to do today. You're number one, you're number two, number three, number four in the flight. And uh, uh, we got our weather briefing. Everything was done in this ready room. We lived in this ready room. We lived in it. Our state rooms were right down this hall right here. We had uh, state rooms. <laughs> um, they were about the size of your bathroom, I would say. <laughs> and you crammed all your stuff in there. Uh, and uh, this is the flight deck right here above us. And every time they trapped aboard, anybody trapped aboard, it, I can't describe the 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 sound but you couldn't hear anybody it just boom for a couple of seconds and of course when you when you trap a board you always go to full power and they would do that right above this ready room right here and it was really loud <laughs> really loud so you had to wait for him to come back on his power and then you could resume your your briefing okay so uh let's assume that what we're going to do today is you're my wingman we're, uh, we're briefed and we're ready to go up to the flight deck to man our airplane. Okay, this is the flight deck, uh, looking at it from above, and you can see that it's a fairly busy place. Now, this is later on, uh, this is after my career, uh, but these are, these are F-14s right here, or F-18s, F-18s, yeah. And this is, this is the current workhorse of the fleet, the F-18 Hornet. Uh, I couldn't... We didn't have cameras back in those days, uh, very good ones that would take pictures, whereas now, you know, this is probably taken from a helicopter off to the side, but you can see how busy this flight deck is. This is the angle deck. Uh, this is the straight deck portion. Um, this, this airplane right here is uh, the E-2, which uh, there's already been one launched here, and he goes up and he is the controller in the sky goes up to about uh, 25, 30,000 feet, and he has a big radar on board, and as the F-18s, as we come off the deck, we're gonna switch to his frequency, and he's gonna tell us where to go and what to do, what the threat is, the, the bearing to steer, and all that. So, you're now, uh, you're now in your F-18, manned up, and you're heading for the catapult, because you gotta get shot, right? Okay, this, this is looking down a, a cat shot right here. There it is. Uh, this is the cat track right here. Underneath that are two huge uh, steel cylinders, about 12 feet long, about this big around, and they're connected 
the two of them are connected uh, on the deck by a shot down here underneath the um, nose, and there, and then your airplane is connected to it, and it's when those cylinders go down the deck, you're going with them. I don't care if your brakes are on or off, you're going with them. It, it is a powerful shot. So uh, let me uh, get you ready here. Uh, this is the CAD officer right here, and he's the guy who is going to actually say, shoot this airplane off the deck. And when he touches the deck, you'll, you'll see this. I'm going to play this video. Uh, when he goes down and touches the deck and comes back up like that, you're going for a ride. So let's do it. Are you ready? <laughs> All right, this is what it looks like from inside of your cockpit at the front of the flight deck. This guy is a taxi director right here. And now he just threw you over. Now your eyes should go over to the other side of the ship and to this guy right here. He's telling you, wind it up. Give it full power. In an F-18, you would light the burner. Meanwhile, you're checking everything in the cockpit, making sure everything's still working. <laughs> you still have the chance to abort right to here. But now he just put his hand down on the deck, and it's too late to abort. Here you go. Zero to 150 miles per hour about in two seconds. Uh, if your head isn't back against the uh, headrest, it will be. <laughs> Okay, so we are we are now airborne. Let's see, I'm gonna do this. Ah. We are now airborne, <clears throat> and we talked to uh, the ship's call sign uh, was strike ops on my ship. It was uh, Mustang. Mustang was the, the name of our strike ops. You call him up on the, the UHF radio, and you say two, uh, my squadron's uh, name was the hobos. Two hobos uh, ready for your control. This is the E2 that's up over the top, and he says, Roger, your steer is 280 for 300 miles. We have a Russian ship we want you to interrogate. This is during the Cold War now. And so we, we bust all the way to this ship, 300 miles. It takes us, you know, 10 minutes because we're, we're at full power. Now, remember this. Military airplanes do not have limitations as far as engines go. We have a thing called MRT, Military Reserve Thrust. And what it means is you're going so fast that the throttle is actually bent forward. <laughs> As civilian airplanes, you go up to a red line and you stop because it has limitations. Military airplanes, you're at MRT, Military Reserve Thrust. So you and I are at Military Reserve Thrust, and we're heading for this ship who could possibly be a threat to the carrier. He's 300 miles away. We get to him. And we see that it is a Russian Kirov. It's a uh, battleship, battle cruisers, what they call them. But you can see that it has uh, a few powerful weapons. Now, this is the Cold War, war now, remember. Um, so what we do is the, the two of us set up on a uh, uh, surveillance run, and you always run parallel to the ship. You never cross the bow. You know why? They'll shoot you. It's an act of war. But uh, flying down the side of it is not all that much better because he's got missiles right in here. And these guys, as, you, as they pick you up coming down the side of the ship, those missiles train right on you. And they're about, about Mach 4 missiles. So you know that if he would have pulled the trigger, you couldn't outrun it. So we watched these things uh, very closely. We were armed as well, but uh, that's... One aspect of the Cold War was that your hand was on the trigger. Uh, and I'll tell you, it was a real temptation, I'm sure, by the Russians especially, to pull that trigger. And so it was, it was a fairly tense time. But anyway, uh, we, do, we do the surveillance. We get pictures of it. We did have cameras that took good pictures. 
And so we are getting low on fuel, and we know we've got to get back to the carrier. It's 300 miles away. Well, the first trick is, how are we going to find it? Uh, because back in the Cold War, you didn't transmit. You didn't transmit uh, because they could pick up on your radio, uh, on your frequency UHF, and uh, track you. And we didn't want that, so we never said any. We said the very minimal. We didn't talk very much. So uh, as we head back to the ship, the, how do you think we found the ship 300 miles away and there's no uh, avionics to tell you? How do you think we found it? Here's the trick. You go to 30,000 feet and you do a 360 degree turn and you have a radar on board and you fly to the biggest blip. <laughs> Many times I did that. And, and the biggest blip uh, 300 miles away was of course the carrier. And so that's where you hit it. And uh, so now what we're going to do is, is we're going to come back and re-enter the, the pattern to land. And, and I think that's the biggest question I get la uh, asked uh, from young guys is what, what was it like to land on a carrier? You know, there's not, they're not real long. Um, so, so this is the way you, uh, you, you came back in to land. Now this is the carrier right down here. You can just barely see it. Uh, this is the inside of an F-18. And I wanted to point out a couple of things here, too. You see these mirrors right here? There's one, two, and there's another one on the other side. Those mirrors um, were very important because you could see who was behind you. And you were always watching. Part, part of your scan was not just the instrument panel, but who's behind you. You can see your wingman. He's probably... The, Hopefully, he is your, the closest to you. Uh, but if you see a black dot closing on you, you, you better pay, pay attention because it's uh, probably not a friendly. So here we are coming back to the carrier, and we did what's called a break. A break is when you come in visually, you see the carrier, and you're coming pretty fast. I'm going to say 500. And you break over the top of the ship and slow down as you make a 360 back to land. Okay. This is what it looks like. He's going about 500 miles an hour right here. Haven't seen the ship yet. Okay, there it is. You see that little white thing? That's the ship. He's closing on it. Now he's, uh, he's just about ready to break over the top of it. There he goes, right there. There's the ship, right there. Okay, what he's doing here... is he's setting up for a, a landing. He's slowing right, he's slowing down right now. He gets down to about 200 uh, knots and he drops his landing gear, he drops his flaps and he's looking for the ship all this time. He's at about 1,200 feet above the ocean. You don't want to get much lower than that until you've got uh, visual aids to get you aboard. There's the ship right there. There he is. There's the wake of the ship. And I'll point things out as we come a little bit closer. Okay, right there is the landing aid, the, what we call the meatball. It's just a vertical uh, indicator of whether you're going to land on the ship or in the water. <laughs> you can see it. Here he comes. Here he comes. He's doing about 150 miles an hour right here. Crosses over the deck and lands. You can see he's getting, he caught a hook and he stops. Right now he's at full tower in case the hook fails or if he missed a, hook, uh, missed a wire. And he is now on flight deck. Uh, right now he's raising his wings because in the Navy your wings come up, uh, which is pretty cool. And you can see all these wings down here, they're actually folded. That's so that you can get 100 airplanes on the ship. If they didn't fold, you could get maybe half that. So he's taxiing down the deck. Okay, so you, you landed. You did a good job. You always, you always have the cockpit open when you take off and land. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was the question? You always have the cockpit open when you take off and land. 
No. <laughs> I, I did. The, the F-9 Cougar that I flew, you could land with the canopy open. That was the only airplane I flew that was uh, open, open canopy. Um, so now, uh, we, did, we did the day landing. We did a good job. Now I'm going to show you the contrast between day and night because at night things get a little bit tenser. Uh, and I don't care who you talk to that has landed at night. Uh, the intensity level <coughs> is fairly high. Uh, your focus is right here. Anything else outside of right here, you don't care about because everything that's going to happen to you in the next few seconds is right here, right in this visual uh, box that you're looking at. So th this side represents the night landing, and you're going to see that this is a, a great video. Uh, on this side, you're going to see what happened, what it looks like in the day. On this side, what it looks like at night. <coughs> This is done by an S-3 aircraft uh, on the Lincoln, uh, and it, 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 these guys did a great job. Okay, here's, here's your day carrier right there, this is your night carrier. <laughs> it fades in and out, <laughs> which is true. So you can see, that's what you see at night right there. This is what it looks like in the day, same position at night. Boom, you're aboard. 150 to zero in two seconds. <clears throat> okay, so that I just wanted to show you uh, what that looked like. like from the ship watching an airplane land, uh, a Hornet in this case. So this is what we have here. Here he comes, his hook's down, his wheels are down, of course, and he crosses the wake, crosses the round down, catches the wire. See, he's got all the 50 feet left there before you go in the water. <coughs> That's what it looks like. Okay, so uh, I guess I, so <laughs> I guess I can answer some questions. Uh, that's a pretty quick flight, but yes, sir. Let's talk about bad weather. Yeah, uh, depending on the criticality of the mission, um, I have launched. Uh, we had critical missions uh, during the Cold War. I have launched when you couldn't see the end of the ship from where you sat in the cockpit. Um, but that's takeoff. Uh, landing, because we did not have the sophistication of hands-off landing back then, which they do now, uh, we, c we had to have about 200 feet and about a half mile visibility, which is about the same as right here uh, in Denver. If you have a half a mile visibility, you can find the runway on an instrument approach. Uh, but nowadays, uh, in fact, I, I have a young friend of mine who flew F-18s um, maybe five years ago, and most of their approaches are automatic. He puts it uh, in auto throttle, automatic, and they can land and do not have to see the deck. That, that scares me. <laughs> Is it you, John? Yeah, because we were experimenting in those in the late, uh, in about mid 70s, we were experimenting with some of these sophisticated avionics that would help us to land. Uh, and frankly, I did not trust them at all. Uh, I had, I was on auto throttle one day, just about to touch down, and the nose pitched down like that. And I had to, you know, yank it back. So, uh, I, I didn't trust it, but that's my generation. I bet your generation, you know, you just punch everything in and sit back and watch it. Uh, and that's how we dealt with uh, poor weather. 
uh, we did have our, our limitations. Now, uh, as far as pitching deck up and down, uh, the Coral Sea, I've launched with 50 foot uh, rise and fall of the deck, 50 feet. Um, and that's not, uh, it's not as dangerous as you think because when you come back to land and this deck back here that you got to land on is going up and down, the visual aid that you're using, the meatball on the lens, is point stabilized. So you fly it down, you, you're not chasing it up and down like this. Then, when you get close to the ship, if in fact it's coming up and it's not going to be a safe clearance between you and it, <laughs> the LSO, the old uh, World War II, what they called him, was paddles, standing on the end of the deck out there, will wave you off and we'll let you near that deck. If he sees the deck is going down and you're going to cross when it's down, he'll bring you aboard. Not a problem. Here I was uh, on a Navy destroyer uh, at the beginning of the Vietnam War to go to Tonkin to some patrols. So I'm the alpha of the Vietnam War. You're the omega. Would you explain a little bit about the Marquez incident that you were involved in? The, was the omega. The uh, Marquez? Yeah. Um, after the evacuation of Saigon in 75, about a month later, uh, the Cambodian people, who were very close to the communism uh, side of Vietnam, uh, they took one of our merchant ships. They captured it, uh, took the crew off, uh, stole the cargo out of it. Uh, the name of the ship was the Mayaguez. Mayaguez. This is in 1975. We uh, were uh, heading towards Australia uh, because the, the cruise was a tough cruise. Uh, we were done with Vietnam. We were going to Australia because they invited us to come down. One morning I woke up and the ship was shaking. And I looked out and the sun's on the other side of the ship and we're heading north instead of south. And sure enough, uh, we were heading for the Mayaguez. Well, what happened was uh, President Jerry Ford uh, allowed us to, uh, first of all, show a little force in Cambodia. And uh, they uh, hurriedly put the crew back on in one of their ships and brought it out to the Mayaguez, put them back on, and they took off. So uh, the the, the bad thing about the Mike was, was the Marines uh, that went ashore to take back the ship. Um, they, took, they took some pretty heavy fire, and uh, 13 of them were killed. Uh, we, <clears throat> we brought those guys back aboard the Coral Sea and uh, put them on the flight deck, and all of the Marines evacuated to our ship. I went down and talked with some of these guys. Uh, it was an amazing process. That's why I have such respect for Marines. These guys, uh, they, they did a tremendous job. And they did it uh, regardless of the risk. They did it. So when we pulled back into the Philippines, the Marines were the first ones off. They had a band to meet them. Uh, the, the fatalities were given Purple Hearts as they came down uh, in the caskets. It was uh, very impressive. Very impressive. That was the mic was. The Cambodians never did that again. That's what happened. And they called that the last battle of the Vietnam War. That was the last one, yep. That was in June of 75. Yeah. Jim? What do you do when you get alongside a Russian ship? Is it just a show of force? Or? No, it's not a sh sign of force. If you cross their bow, it would be a sign of force. You would never cross the bow. You you would always uh, if you if you if he was under attack, you would attack the ship. We had tactics to do that before you cross the bow because that gave him permission to shoot you. So basically, all you were doing during the Cold War was just uh, taking pictures of the ship, watching the movement of the missiles, seeing how they would react to to us. That's all you were doing. Uh, yeah, but you 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 are moving as fast as you.
and that thing was fast. It was uh, 400 knots plus. So they, every time the Perry would come out of uh, the Philippines headed for Vietnam, they would fly one of these spares over just to see what you had on board. Well, what we did was we took the crane, the big crane, put it out in the middle of the deck and covered it with uh, a big tarp. So, you know, we had a secret weapon there. And the, the Russians, they fly by that. to intercept him and then they escort him. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, if you could try to keep him away, you could, but sometimes they fly away. Sometimes they fly away. Yeah. Yeah. Cold War was a very interesting uh, set of circumstances. And uh, trust me when uh, I say that we, uh, we stood firm during the Cold War. And if we wouldn't have, many countries would still be suffering today under communism. Uh, that's the way I saw it. Yes, sir. I, you talked about two of you flying along the Russian ship. I assume when you had to head back to the carrier because of fuel, somebody else took your place. Is that right? Depending on whether uh, strike ops would <coughs> would uh, say, oh, we have enough data or not. If we didn't have enough, they'd launch more aircraft to do this. Uh, the the problem with uh, the F the, the F four was our fighter type on when I was on the ship was the fan and he was fuel critical <laughs> on takeoff. <laughs> they, they they burned so much fuel that they were for fuel critical all the time. Where the A seven uh, we had uh, a good two hours worth of fuel at full power. The fan was worth about uh, 13 minutes at full power. Oh, 13 minutes. So that's the reason why we got the mission. The A6s were the same way. Uh, I had talked to the A6 guy the other day. They, they did the same mission, uh, only they could do it in worse weather than we could. We had to have a visual to drop on a target. The A6s did not. They had a radar that once the target was positively identified, it was theirs. Uh, the A7, we had to visually see that target. You never you know. Better you better you better say that? yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my Boulder story is uh, I went into, uh, we were working up off of the coast of San Diego, and uh, I went into Lamore, which is where we were stationed, to get the company checks. Next day was payday, and we were pulling into San Diego. I had a stack of checks. This is when they paid with paper. Uh, and I went back out to the ship, and it was rolling, rolling deck that night. Uh, three bolters later, I'm, I'm now critical on fuel, and the captain says, uh, this is your last try. And I'm sitting with a stack of checks, and if I don't get them to these sailors. <laughs> so the ball comes up, my last pass, here comes the ball, and it's centered, and it starts to rise. And I know if it rises above center, I'm going to be boltered four times. So I stop that ball just like that. Just stop it right there. And what happened was it was a rising deck and I got aboard that blew both main tires. Ooh. That, that's, that's a hard landing. Hard landing, yeah. It shook me. My back hurt for days. <laughs> but I got the checks to the boys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> that's my bolter story. Everybody has bolters. <laughs> they didn't have you go hit the tanker, huh? No. <laughs> the tanker was, I was the last guy. Oh, okay. So, the pressure was on. Yeah. It was, the tanker it was, was on the ground in San Diego. <laughs> Can you address the fact that the ship's crew and the air crew were two different organizations in the same? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, black shoe versus brown shoe. Uh, the air wing and all of its people were allowed to wear brown shoes because we were just a bit different uh, than black shoes who ran the, the ships. Uh, black shoes, we, we had some, uh, uh, some problems sometimes between brown and black shoes. 
So when Zumo, one of the things that he did, Admiral Zumo, was he said, we're going to make everybody black shoes. So all the aviators were tipped because we, you know, we were a little bit different. So he, we built a big um, coffin. It's about <laughs> 10 by 10, and put all our brown shoes in it, and they shot her off the catapult. <laughs> we, we, I was uh, in San Diego, Miramar. We put them in the coffin and buried it on the old club wall. <laughs> <laughs> it went off the end of the catapult, and the box blew apart. Shoes went everywhere. <laughs> uh, so the difference is uh, I have tremendous respect for the boat people, the black shoes. I understand now it's back to uh, brown shoes or the aviators, black shoes or the ship drivers. Is that right? they, they made that later, yeah. after Zoom Wolf. So. It's only the aviators, though. Yeah. Uh, the rest of the, right. the, the enlisted aviators, guys are black. So black. And, and there is some history behind that. I mean, back in the uh, first carrier days or aviation days, we uh, the naval naval air and I don't know if they still have the greens aviation greens but yeah. the well, aviators are wore, bringing them back yeah aviators wore aviation greens mm -hmm. and the surface and they didn't wear they weren't allowed to wear the greens mm -hmm. and that's when the brown shoe was was worn with those aviation greens it looked like a lot like marine yeah yeah the <coughs> all these drafts yeah and then the, the yeah. brown shoes carried on until Zumwalt didn't like mm -hmm. it. But my hat is off to the families of military people because uh, it's a tremendous uh, burden on families to to be part of a military family. My, my hat is way off to those guys. Um, there is an organization called Home Front. Home Front. It's a uh, website that you can actually go on and uh, adopt a, a military family. Uh, and just uh, even though they're stationed in California or Florida, you can connect with these these families where their husbands or wives, in many cases, are are gone for six to nine months. And you can actually communicate with these people, uh, ask them how you can be of assistance. Uh, our our enlisted people uh, don't make much money. They don't. They, they suffer, especially when you have three little ones about this big. Uh, home front, if you're interested, you can, you can help support. There's many organizations like that, but Home Front is one. I think we ought to wrap this up. It's because <coughs> of sat long enough. But, uh, thank, thank you for what you guys Should all did. And your stories are <laughs> Amazing, right? Three days is just beautiful, organized, beautiful thing. So, hey! Try, if you get a chance or know somebody who's eligible to go on a flight, go. It's a beautiful experience. Thank you for that.